Hello, this is Trebuchet Talks, a podcast that increases the range of art through interviews with great contemporary artists you may not have heard of yet. We aim to dig a little deeper and bring you a different snapshot of art in the UK. Yes, we're based in London, but art transcends boundaries, not least of which is the M25. I'm Kailesh and I'm coming to you from Trebuchet Towers in the heart of North West London. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How's things going? Yeah, things are going good. Um, I've been venturing out into the big wide world, which is very exciting, uh, with my masks, of course. How about you? What have you been up to? The uh, magazine's finally out, so we've been doing press and publication stuff and marketing along with that, making sure the different distributors have got their copies and working on our big reveal which will come later in the podcast. <laughs> Exciting things to come. Absolutely. At the time of recording, we're still reasonably unsure what galleries are going to be opening and when. There are some provisional dates here and there, but the government in the UK, at least, is still being reasonably cagey about how we should act and whether it's optional or mandatory or the level of seriousness of how we should behave. Starting to open are the October Gallery and a few others in London and certainly different galleries around the rest of the country are looking at ways to get the public involved in their practices. What exactly that means, I guess we're waiting to find out. One story I heard is from people visiting the National Gallery where they're staggering how people move about the space and on a positive note, some people were noting that it was actually a much better experience than they'd had previously because they had some alone time with the artwork where I think we've all had the experience of of clamoring for certain works and trying to get a bit of space and a, a bit of time with a particular painting. So I really like that idea um, just because I do find that I, I sometimes find myself kind of wandering aimlessly around a, a gallery kind of going uh, what what should I look at next so I think if there's kind of um a way that you follow uh, and it kind of guides you and you're given a, spe- um, a specified kind of amount of time um that kind of lends itself quite well to me um so I think I think it's good um I think any way that people can kind of get back out out there actually into galleries is great um yeah so I'm I'm all for that. Um, it's better than uh, wandering around the virtual galleries, hey? So, Do you think it's a bit constricting having a route, like following the, 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 the caterpillar trail around a gallery rather than kind of making up your own wandering narrative? Do you, yeah. It sounds like you don't mind that so much. I don't mind it. I don't mind it. Um, so I think... I've also got in in my mind. I've got one of those um, little caterpillar kind of uh, roller coasters that they have at the seaside. I don't know why that's just come into my head, but it has. Um, maybe they should do that. Put a little caterpillar kind of uh, roller coaster around galleries. Who knows? That could work. The only thing that kind of concerns me is how are they going to make sure that people are moving on at the right time? Because you know, some people love to kind of stop and be at something for kind of ten minutes. Some people literally will just read the name of something and and want to move on so I kind of wonder how they're gonna do that um I'm sure it'll be a trial and error kind of thing but I think anything that gets people back is great I mean to that point I think your your caterpillar idea might be the the solution in that way you've got to You've got to take in art at the at the speed of the caterpillar, at the speed of the roller coaster as it drifts around a gallery. I mean, the, you're absolutely right. You bring up a, a great point. I mean, there's there's always going to be someone, and, and often it'll be you, of course, or, or I or whoever, who suddenly gets entranced by a painting. And, you know, unfortunately, that means that the person behind you is theoretically, I suppose, stuck in front of a painting that they're more than really ready to move on from so over it yeah so over it ready to move on to the next one mate come on exactly uh yeah <laughs> i think you know it's just a really interesting time so i think we just have to kind of uh watch out for what's going to happen see how people are going to take it um you know will people actually want to go on the trains uh and tubes and you know public transport to get to galleries i think a lots of people uh, are really really keen to get out and about and other people aren't so keen um so i think it just just time will tell really
the other thing of course is that as soon as you've got a particular contrivance that isn't part of the art experience in and of itself does potentially limit how you will see and how you view the art um Mm -hmm. for myself i think i i quite like moving around an artwork and looking at it from different spaces and from different distances to get a a different feeling of it sometimes it's close-up detail that that, that that triggers me in a good way or, or glimmers me, I suppose, if, if using a, a, a common term now for meaning a, a positive trigger. Um, and then further away sometimes does it, you know. So how they enforce these sorts of things um, it'll be interesting to see. And if, is this, as we say in the UK, the new normal? What does that mean? Are we going to get used to it and it'll become invisible by being so prevalent that we you know block it out as as being a distraction or will it always jar yeah it's an interesting thing i think um you know until we have a vaccine i think it is going to be this is the way it's going to be right uh so uh, i think we just have to try and pull up our britches and get on with it as best as we can kind of thing you know art in the time of the pandemic (laughs) exactly exactly um, but I mean, you know, I would have thought that um, artists living through the pandemic is going to create some amazing artworks. The the kind of hardship that people have gone through is going to create some amazing work. So I, I disagree. No? Okay. <laughs> I, well, I, I disagree because absolutely there'll be a lot of work produced. However, whether I want to listen to an album about the pandemic depicting someone's experience of their isolation and lockdown for at least 18 months, I think's up for up for debate. I'm probably going to, you know, hunting dogs, um, Dutch windmills, anything that reminds me of something I can't currently see from my my window or whatever will be far more appealing to me than, you know, another two years of people's descriptions of something i've lived through so i i you know we'll have to wait and see how that actually pans out well yeah i suppose that's true isn't it i mean it's it's like a big shared trauma that we've all gone through so listening to other people's uh, interpretation of it could become problematic for some people so yeah maybe we need a bit of time a little bit of space (laughs) between the experience and what we're gonna yeah the viewing i suppose I don't know. We'll see. Of course, on the other side of that, it might be that some artists are actually describing a sense of escapism in their art. I think we're always going to need escapism. And now more than ever, it might be that we're actually potentially on a positive note going to see a flowering of a new sense of escapist art that really takes people into, uh, again, I suppose this is being wildly optimistic into something more communal and universalist where the world suddenly gets together and you know joins hands or something i don't know that now now we're getting into the, now things come by yeah, it's possible we're getting into the realm of the absurd you can also imagine that one one direction that people could take in isolation is quite dark and another route might be something quite um I don't know, space art or something like that. You could see other people going a different way. So it'll be interesting. It will be interesting. And that's the other thing. As you said, we're all dealing with a collective trauma. So the idea of a looking at how people have dealt with this trauma through a different lens, be it race, sex, colour, location, whatever, you know, it will be will be a fantastic thing, I think. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next few years, for sure. What's been going on with you? So I've recently started this initiative called One Minute Meditation, basically because the videos in Instagram and TikTok are one minute long. And I thought that it's quite hard to get somebody to go through to a website to watch a longer meditation. And I thought that people could do with a bit of calming their limbic system down. And that is possible in a minute. You just have to kind of know the right cues to use. So what's the limbic system? So you have your sympathetic response and your parasympathetic response. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to tip the balance from one to the other to flood your body with kind of feel-good hormones. Is that related to this idea that I think a few people have spoken about where you've got what they call your computer brain and your chimp brain and then your ego 
or human brain in a sense. So your chimp brain is the one that reacts based on, I think, what you're talking about, like limbic or triggers or whatever. Your mm -hmm. computer brain is the recall part of your brain that has certain things that it can access. And then, you know, your, your conscious brain, if you will, is the one that, you know, hopefully we're talking about now where we kind of reflect on things and it's... The problem with the conscious brain is it tends to be a bit more after the fact where, you know, I think we've all had that experience where you're yeah. on the tube later on and you're like, oh, if only I said that, that would have been so amazing. Or that would have been a much more mature way to respond to that experience than what I did do, which was <laughs> suboptimal. Let's put it that way, you know. One of the things that uh, my mindfulness teacher taught me when I was first learning mindfulness was you learn to uh, respond rather than react. And that is very much that point. So the reaction is the chimp brain and the response is kind of, you know, your, your computer brain. I think it's, it's something that you can train yourself to do. Um, it doesn't always work. Like yeah. there's times where... There's times, there's times where no. you know you can do, you could have done all the work in the world, all of the meditation in the world, and that that um, that chimp brain will still kick kick your ass from time to time, um, which is fine. <laughs> it's totally fine. It's it's kind of uh, recognizing that, realizing that, and kind of taking a breath and um, just trying to do your best, really. So really, with these one minute meditations, I'm just trying to give people a, a taster of um, how you can use these techniques to kind of help you in those situations to learn to respond rather than react and that kind of stuff there's also a couple of them which are just pure relaxation so um i take you through a very quick body scan but i wouldn't and a body scan is a type of meditation where you focus on different parts of your body either going from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet Obviously, in a minute, you can't really do that. Otherwise, I'd be talking really, really quickly. <laughs> That's pretty... I mean, that would be a weird one. So I just do the face. And um, yeah, so you just relax your face from the top of your head down to your chin. And that's actually a really good uh, technique that people can just use generally. And it's a good technique that you can use if you're kind of feeling stressed. And I was taught it as three minute, a three minute meditation. Um, but I figured, do you know what? We're busy people. Come on, let's cut it down to a minute. Come on. So it's almost like tricking that kind of subconscious part of the brain as well. Because, you know, sometimes our subconscious brains are pretty cynical. Um, they've had a lot to uh, deal with in the past. So you might say, try this new thing. And your subconscious brain will be like, no, not doing it. So I think the ritual thing is very interesting. Um, making a cup of coffee, you know, on a mocha pot on the top of a, uh, a stove is a like really ritualistic kind of way of... Uh, being mindful is almost like a meditation, I would say. That's an interesting point because there's something I've been thinking about when they're talking about COVID-19 systems. The loss of smell and taste is often something that comes up regularly. Now, a lot of neuroscientists, and I, you know, I don't have any studies in front of me, of course, but they're saying that the way we create memories is often linked or triggered by smells. So I wonder if this period of isolation matched with a, a lack of taste and, and smell, we're kind of entering a miasma of, of dreamlike forgetfulness where things are drifting from one um, experience to another without the, the sharp contrasts that smells allow. Yeah, smells are definitely very uh, uh, kind of synced in, into my memory. Very much like I can smell a certain smell and it takes me right back to a memory. So, yeah, if you're not smelling anything, how, are your memories going to be different? Are you still going to have memories? Like, How do you order them? Yeah. We were speaking earlier about how sometimes people have a difficulty recalling when, when like, doorstep challenged, asked on the spot what their favourite book album movie is people suddenly draw a blank oh uh, gosh uh oh i don't know but if you ask people about the smells is that different what what's your favorite smell like for a lot of people or certainly I, I grew up in australia as people may be able to pick from my my voice but the smell of cut grass and and two-stroke lawnmower fuel 
as a particularly strong memory. How about you, Megan? Um, so I really like Chanel Number no. Five. My grandma used to wear it. It's, it was the only perfume she would wear, um, and that. So when I smell that, it takes me. It, it, it reminds me of my grandma instantly. Also, frankincense. So whilst I wasn't brought up in the Catholic faith, my mum was. She likes to say that she's a lapsed Catholic. So even though she was a lapsed Catholic, we went to the Catholic churches a lot, and they have um, big. Uh, frankincense that kind of incense swingers and uh, even though I was desperately bored at the um, at the church the smell was just such a fantastic smell that just to this day I love I love frankincense it's like the most perfect smell to me yeah um uh, and and I'm a bit of a hippie as well so I suppose (laughs) there's that as well I love a bit of incense so yeah those are my favorite smells Well, as I believe everyone should know, we've launched Issue 8, Contemporary Surrealism, out to the the big wide world. And I've been pleased to note that people really like it. Copies have been going out. The responses on Instagram and social media have been very favourable. People have said that uh, it's it's a good issue. And I suppose we're touching on a lot of topics and concerns that, people have in the world today though you know you don't necessarily think about that when you're you're putting the issue together so that's going quite good uh obviously it's been very busy and it continues to be busy in that sense but we're 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 getting on with it but the big news is that we're offering something new to subscribers recently trevor shea started a discussion about how artists could reach a broader audience and how we might facilitate building a network of fledgling art collectors What if we could encourage our subscribers to start collecting by helping them dip a toe in the water and experience art appreciation as an owner? We could send regular updates on featured artists, shows, new work, key sales and more, as well as demystifying art collection and helping emerging artists and -and up-and-coming galleries reach a new audience. So we propose that each subscriber receives an exclusive signed and numbered print to build their collection and to track the progress of an artist over time. Our first subscriber art print is already here. It's a signed and numbered limited edition print of A Reckoning by the artist James Johnston. Coming back to painting relatively late in his creative career, Johnston's visual work has already gathered global attention, being featured in galleries and collections around the world. Some listeners will be aware of his previous creative work, fronting the band Gallant Drunk, as well as notable stints with PJ Harvey, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, and Faust, amongst others. His paintings are both bold and loose, marked by a rich and striking use of colour. The often unsettling, darkly humorous and totemic images are based between the everyday and the world of the imagination, grounded with a sense of simplicity and beauty. Quite a prolific painter, Johnston's work has been used on book covers as album artwork and featured in a variety of international arts publications, like Trebuchet, with paintings in the collection of the University of Chicago Centre in Paris, amongst others. For more information, you can visit our subscriber print page via the subscription section of our site. And at £35 for four issues of the magazine, plus four signed prints, it's a fun way to build your art collection and also read something good. So now it's time for our subscriber shout out section. It's a bit of fun where what we do is we say thank you to subscribers by reading out a part of a seminal text that we use for our uh, current issue. The current book that we're reading from is A Cavalier History of Surrealism, which contains, uh, if, if listeners from the last podcast will remember some pretty pretty juicy stuff it's a pretty pretty mental book with lots of information and also quite pithy summations of surrealism so a big thanks to everyone of course who listens or talks about the podcast or recommends us but this is a way of us giving a bit of an extra thank you to those people that have helped us put the podcast together and you know keep doing this and keep doing what we love So at the £3 level, subscribers get a juicy phrase pulled at random from the pages of our book. Subscribers who offer £7 get a tasty sentence. And those wonderful people that subscribe to the highest amount will receive a full paragraph 
of thought-provoking wit. And so at the first tier, we have M. Pink, whose phrase is, poetry is incitement to practice. The third tier subscribers we have, we have four in this episode. The first one is Sarah W. Any attempt at a total revolution of everyday life is condemned to failure and fragmentation if it does not embody a coherent and global negative critique. Next up, we have Alejandro from Mexico. These revolutionaries of the heart were fated to carry out their revolution solely in the realm of the mind. Next up is Peter O. All were allegedly unified by a shared quality of freedom, yet in reality they remained isolated. And finally, we have Barry. Love in particular, and justifiably so, was the object of surrealism's most firmly and consistently sustained hopes. So that's it for the subscriber shout-outs for this episode. Subscribe and hear your name associated with some pretty crazy verbiage. (laughs) Thank you so much, everyone, for allowing us to do this and keep listening. In this postcard from a gallery, we have an excerpt from an interview with James Seehafer, the namer, perhaps founder of the Mass Surrealist Movement, recorded as part of our research for Trebuchet 8, Contemporary Surrealism. In 2004, the book Mass Surrealism, a Dossier, was published. This is essentially a collection of short essays written by five of us. We have artists that have come and gone in the group, artists who enjoy the genre and have branched off to do other things. A more recent release, book-wise, is one titled Three Essays About Mass Surrealism. And this is essentially a re-release of Select Essays, International Edition. Cecil Tuchon is one of our colleagues in our group, and he has published several books of his master realist poetry. In the mid to late 1980s, I became quite interested in how popular culture and the mechanized world, so to speak, uh, affects my work and the early influences essentially in all that. I can recall back in high school working at a grocery store. There one sees ads and product placement and all kinds of uh, slick presentations everywhere. And I know that a grocery store is probably the last place one would find or one would expect to find inspiration, but it was my process at the time. My shopping cart series I did, which is something I was having fun with, were studies to see if I can bring something so mundane to a more of an existentialist level. Now, whether or not I did that, (laughs) I I don't really know. Uh, But people kept asking me, you know, James, what do you do? What is your work? What does it describe it? And this is what led me to coining the phrase. I mean, I I keep in mind, I do not consider myself some high academic guy or philosopher. But this is why I came up with the word, because it was really not pop art I was doing, nor classical surrealism, nor strictly technology art. It was basically a combination of all all these basics. So I found it to be easier to put that word out there, because instead of just trying to go through one paragraph or two about what my work actually is. In time... Other artists have identified with mass surrealism to one extent or another. My good friend, whom I met in Connecticut years ago, the American artist Michael Morris, has done numerous works and has written some excellent thoughts on the topic. When I first put this on the web, I started receiving emails from artists worldwide. I initially set up the .com website, which over time became the .org site basically now that the site is more of an independent collaborative run site this is where we showcase other artists works and projects interesting projects too and it seems as if this niche is becoming more relevant today more so than in 1992 and today one can see so much going on you know, just look at the Instagram, for example. We can see hobbyists and professionals doing some really fantastic work. And it's not limited to just digital augmented photography. There is just an amazing amount of things that can be done. In fact, recently there was an art student who did a video presentation. And it was essentially a collection of master realist art examples pulled from the web. And this included examples from not just from multimedia, but also multi-tech advertising demos to bus stop kiosks, as well as CGI. So long as people continue to dream in this day and age, mass surrealism will stick around. In a video excerpt in my essay that had been recently posted on the web, I pulled a quote from Marshall McLuhan, which I really like. In fact, there were two quotes. There was one 
quote uh, about art as anti-environment. And then the other one where he states, and let me read this directly, quote, instead of scurrying into a corner and wailing about what media are doing to us, one should charge straight ahead and kick them in the electrodes, unquote. Essentially, in a nutshell, despite the technological and mass media influence it has on art, the human element is still in charge of it all. Suffice it to say that a lot of people get overwhelmed today by media, but there is no reason to feel this way. I guess maybe this is a collateral effect. At the end of the day, the reins are in the hands of humans, and by staying aware of what's going on, one can identify what things are not real, but rather mass surreal. Maybe that's a good thing. So without further ado, we have our feature talk with Luciana Hale. Luciana has pioneered the monitoring of brainwaves, the EEG signal, in art. Her work intersects new technology, creativity and research with dreams, the brain and the unconscious to make a mental process visible, in particular lucid dreams, meditation and nostalgia. She's concerned in seeing with eyes closed and esoteric ways of accessing and retrieving the visionary to create her art. Please welcome Luciana. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, sorry for mangling your, your, your process a little bit. Uh, maybe you could describe it a bit more. And or, I believe you have some movies you'd like to show. So, so yeah, what do you think would be best to show? Well, maybe explain a bit about what you do and then maybe okay. use it to have a look at the videos after that. Okay. I'll explain a little bit about it. Um, really, the, the video will help a lot more. Hi. Hello, best friend. <laughs> um, so, I'm trained in fine art, and I explore the medium of uh, the EEG signal from the brain to create uh, installations, and often I record them whilst the participants, sometimes it's not just myself, um, are, during, are undergoing an altered state that I'm part of the process of inducing. So we look at and we experience their brain waves mm. in an, in a well, I could say holistic way, but audiovisual, digital media output. Um, and my research is following the pioneers in neuroscience from the 1800s onwards. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I'm described as an interdisciplinary artist. So I work in many different media. Um, I've been doing this for about 25 years. I evolve with different technologies. And my work explores memory, nostalgia, um, altered states, surrealism. And I like to take people into a place they maybe haven't experienced before. So I think now would be a good time to play one of the videos either the one of the participant or of an installation. Okay. Just press pause. Thank you. What we're actually looking at is there is a participant here <coughs> in a dentist chair. This is in a warehouse in Bermondsey called the Ugly Duck. It has rather fantastic a Victorian or Edwardian wallpaper of palm trees. Uh, I won this exhibition space in a call out and I particularly liked using what was already existing in the space when I projected the participants wearing an EEG monitor, which I'll tell you much more about in the next sort of few minutes. But what we're seeing with this kind of colorful mountainous scape on top of him, I've superimposed this after the session, are his brain waves during their experience of, there's a flashing light and that will become more apparent. The flashing light is like over there. So they're experiencing a flashing light with their eyes closed. They've signed a, a consent form, because of course this is not suitable for everybody for various reasons. And they're hearing the resultant changes through headphones. And this is what I'm also playing you as a soundtrack. So now it might make a bit more sense. We can see some of the brainwave frequencies. I'll fill you in a bit more about those shortly. And this is speeded up, this, as it said at the beginning, 7 to 12 minutes in under two.
So people were told there would be flashing lights, they could sign up for a sort of 15 minute slot in an ongoing installation that happened over four days in the Ugly Duck, uh, part of the real virtual exhibition, that was in 2017. Mm. And every time I take this work out, I, I learn from it and I modify it somewhat. So if there's too much feedback about a certain element being unpleasant. The sounds they are hearing... Was they that are the same as the sound that we heard? Exactly that. So that, the whispering of my voice, I've actually recorded the feedback that people have told me, either yeah. verbally or we have recorded uh, you know, in written form, what they saw. So when their eyes are closed, the light stimulates the visual cortex of the brain and they start to experience things they don't expect, okay. they don't anticipate. So what I hear the most is, <coughs> I didn't expect that wow, those sort of things, and then some other people are able to describe it a bit more elaborately, mm -hmm. what they saw Catherine wheels, you know, patterns and so on, but other people describe So there is journeys. a visual element to it. Incredibly, so eyes closed so I, this is an artwork that yeah. I use alongside Brian Geisen from the, like, the Dream Machine's description yeah. an artwork to be experienced with the eyes closed, and that's a quote because everything happens subjectively to you and it's going to be different for each one of you who try it, uh -huh. that's why each person says I didn't expect that so is there um, a guided element to it with the, the audiovisual stimulation and the, the kind of connections of what people see? So are you, kind of are you, in essence, are you, it would be nice to think, are you painting with their minds in some oh. sense? So that when they shut their eyes, you kind of go, okay, I'm going to give them a bit more of a Catherine wheel here or that sort of thing? That could be, but it's not. Oh. Because, of the, <laughs> because the lights are purely white, so you imagine sitting in front of a, well, going to a nightclub first of all, we've all done that, right? White strobe lights, yeah, you know, yeah. and you're in the fog and you're like dancing and you see all different things. You lose your friends, you see different faces. Now imagine being in the comfort of a very well-attended, secure space where you have somebody watching over you and looking at your brain waves, uh, yet you're having the white light experience behind yeah. your closed eyes. Uh, you start to see patterns and if you let go a bit further, I could use the word surrender, but the more you let go and feel safe, and that's part of my role yeah, as the artist, yeah. is to assist that, um, you will possibly go deeper. And it, parts of your subconscious, not parts, um, elements from your subconscious can come towards the forefront of your mind because oh. of the frequencies I've employed, such as yeah. slow wave frequencies. I'm not doing fast, aggressive patterns to challenge yeah. and upset anyone. In fact, they're quite close to meditative frequencies. Um, you were speaking about the brainwave mapping, so looking at, I think, you know, theta, beta and delta waves. The, what part of your artistic practice uses those how do you interact uh, with the, the data that you get? So that's the vital bit. So I've been studying brainwaves signature uh -huh. uh, since university in the 90s. So self-taught in neurofeedback. And I don't think I would undertake working with brainwaves artistically if I didn't have some thorough grounding because then you're just making assumptions and you know comparing brain waves to you know other analogous things yeah um, it's really important to understand what the waves can be and there's i call it i suppose cognitive flexibility not everyone goes bang i'm in alpha at eight sorry eight hertz being the speed of a certain brain wave that people begin to feel relaxed at right well it's not a, like a it's not like the car third gear you know you don't just enter it it's uh you know that's as a variable but it's around that frequency yes so um, I've, st I've studied it and I've worked actually around the corner from here that's when I walked here tonight I walk worked in John Street or St John Street across the road as a neurofeedback assistant therapist All right. and um, there I learned to use the QEG so we would have um, I think it was like 21 channels yeah. so it's a thing that looks more like a shower cap right. different to what I use for my artworks but yeah. I'm using frontal lobe you can apply it quite quickly it's a bit like having um, a headband put across your forehead underneath that there are electrodes mm. it doesn't make anyone's hair go messy no there are many things about like artworks and EG that don't don't work yeah. in the, unless you're doing a long performance and when I worked as a therapist we'd have to apply this equipment but of course what you get is a very good signal and many more channels and that was used it's not used for diagnosis it was used to help people mainly to de-stress okay and that helped inform my next work which was the extra is the ecstasis so I think that's a segue yeah <laughs>
Ecstasis. Yeah, a little louder than necessary. <laughs> uh, I use that from the Greek to step outside of oneself. So okay. I'm not sure it's exact, you know, use of the uh, term, but I was inspired recently by work I've been developing, uh -huh. wanting to make a fortified commodification of art because it's very oh. hard to make a living when you do this. You know, people don't generally pay you to rock up and you know, bring a dentist chair and occasionally they do. And this one yeah. was actually in Slovenia and they provided the dentist chair. It was electric. I've got my own one, but that was great. Oh, wow. so, I'm, so I designed Ecstasis, or Ecstasis to be um, a kind of concentrated way of accessing flow state. So the participant there described or compared it to meditation yeah. with elements of crazy, but also the roller coaster felt very calm to him. Yeah. That's not usual. So what you experience is kind of selflessness, effortlessness. Um, you kind of lose yourself. Is that would that be the definition of a flow state? Imagine if you're you know snowboarding or if you're like having the best run of your of the week or you know you're doing the thing that you just lose yourself sort in. Sort of endorphin rush. Yeah. Sort of thing. So I'm I created this from all the artworks kind of feedback and made a kind of portable distributable, bookable version, okay. which doesn't involve ga art galleries that um, I do with private clients. Right. And I asked one of them yesterday, what does he get from this? I said, I'm going to be giving a talk. Yes. Is there something you could say that's not you know, too personal about what we do? And he just said, and he's done it the longest, it reveals things to himself hmm. that, that he doesn't get when he does already meditates and What's already sort of focuses. And he's a, a busy kind of, in, you know, like involved in investment yeah. kind of, a lot of traveling, a lot of um, jet lag and so on. So we work on different things. Mm -hmm. And um, is it, as an extension of your artistic practice, does that kind of therapeutic work, I suppose, for want of a term. Uh, does that feed back into your art, into your own art that you do more in a gallery context, or is that, are, are they the same? They're the same. You know, I, I, what I make is what I'm interested in, and primarily I've always been obsessed with surrealism and Dada and yeah. so on, and fluxes, so what I learn from participants and guests and private clients yes. is confidential. I must mention that, for me, as an artist, this is a really dodgy area to be involved in. Recording people's brainwaves, no one asks me about neuroprivacy and the ethics of this. Yeah. And I think this is like something which people are going to be using more and more. Now devices and yeah. pieces of technology are really accessible. For a few hundred pounds, you can have something that plugs in. You know, I'm not saying, oh, mine's super expensive, but I use a yeah. bespoke piece of equipment. People are going to be recording brainwaves. You might see something potentially which is yes. pathological, you know, neuro sort of like, you know, on, not not great and people might want to access that information yeah. so as an artist you have a responsibility to keep that private utterly so there is that uh, we, we interviewed you uh, for oh, I'll ask you some questions for the, the issue on portraiture yeah. um, and our interest there was about the idea that what you know what investigating what a portrait is of course and you've you know you've tapped on something that's in as you're pointing out like in deeply personal, someone's brain waves. Do you often find that there's a fear with participants that <gasps> you're going to find out my, my 
darkest secret? Do you know what the most common thing is? You're, you're going to see me just flatline your system. It's like everyone's <laughs> nervous little joke, you know. Oh, you won't get anything from me before they sit in a chair. And of course, they have to have three electrodes put here and one on the neck. It's like a ground. So, I mean, that's all the yeah. kind of it. The rest is just, I have to give them a sense of assurance, as, along with a form, yes. that everything is private. Yes. If they don't like it, there's a sign, put your finger up, put your hand up, and we stop. If the light and the frequencies and the experience is overwhelming, and occasionally that happens from somebody who's been queuing for ages. Right. They get to the, their turn, and so I say their turn, it's their experience. Do other people witness people Generally uh, in their experience, not, or is occasionally, it kind of private? Right? Occasionally we've had to do it that way, like in um, more pop-up events, like recently I've done yeah. Mo Modern Panic, um, Hackstock, quite a few times. These happen around Truman Building, sort of Shoreditch. Yeah. We call it more cyberdelic. There's lots of uh, walk portable and VR and immersive work going on yeah. all at once. So people are often all in the same space and they're watching the previous people take their turn but when they come out the I sometimes use a bed as well like an inflatable bed okay when that person gets out could you just tell them while I'm dealing with the next person and I can hear what they're saying and it's like you can it's like oh my goodness but you know no one's scared off by that they're yeah. like yeah yeah and how much you know how when's my go when they, they want to do it have there been any um it sounds like a practice where you're discovering a lot about the nature of how people's brains work and how their psyches work and and the, some of the, the psychological aspects of, of you know, fear and, and uh, flow states. What are, what are the, some of the revelations that you've had from, from your practice and looking in and discovering things about people? Um, I found that one of the things people want to achieve the most and they say, will this be like this? Some people, for, for whatever reason, who can't take uh, a substance such as LSD, will ask, will it be like that? And right. I say, I can create that sort of thing for you if that's what you'd like. <laughs> that's not currently what the artwork's about. You know, I can just, like, adjust a few levels, you know, so I've people had People slip you a tenner and uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm going out later, so... <laughs> well, I was a research fellow for Greenwich <laughs> University, so the slipping a tenner's not really um, appropriate, but, um, <laughs> no, it's a really, that's a natural kind of thing. And then when I interview them, have you ever had an experience like this what often comes back is is this private so yes and there's a certain substance which is like it was very much like this right you know so an endogenous kind of experience that they've had so you know oh. fantastic well any questions do there's one at the back Ed I'm interested in <coughs> what the reading comes out yeah so it doesn't come out in Language or how do you Gosh, yeah, it's so fleeting that there is another slide I think that might actually have more of the EEG in it. So I measure the, the signal from the brain in voltage, that's the, the height of the signal, and the speed is along that way, and they're broken into the common frequency bandwidths. Over here? So have you looked at the effects of psychoactive drugs on yeah, off the record, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, if I was in an art gallery space, I wouldn't accept anybody as a, from the audience to be in the installation because the light is so powerful, the strobe light that I utilise to, you know, to trigger my art would be far too powerful on somebody who's already under any influence. So I can talk to you about that sort of thing, you know, after we've finished around 8.30 or later on. That's very interesting. I found the whole portraiture thing very interesting, so... Why do we have a kind of specular graph? Why the graph is uh, replicated? Oh, sorry, yes, well, um, um. left and right hemispheres, so from the frontal lobe, yeah, yeah I should, the obvious yeah. thing I should have said, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Completely symmetrical. On that occasion, a very symmetrical reading, but somebody yeah. I was with yesterday, we don't anticipate symmetry, and in fact, coherence is another graph you can look at to see if left... I can see, yeah, there yeah. are more differences, but there are differences. So that's frontal parietal one yeah. and frontal parietal two. Okay, that's... So is, was there a, a, a big event up here? I think that was like a big sigh, like probably preparing. You get a general kind of like cleft or crest of um, activity. And then, right. you, as you can see, there were no peaks. And the only peaks, or donuts as they get called, are here. It's a very clear, concentrated, you can't argue with that kind of reading. Yeah. And if someone was like deeply meditating, let me just say, if you imagine that and shift it all the way down to about here, yeah. and then even make it higher, that would be my best kind of recording of anybody deeply 
uh, inwards. And you say about you know when you look at a portrait, you yeah. don't know what they're doing. So this is a portrait, so really. This is a portrait. This is a portrait of me reading a particular book. You know, let's imagine which one it was. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Uh, I think it was Goethe. So yeah, <laughs> challenged. <laughs> Fantastic. What is this art? And, and what it, you're doing it in performance, but are you actually selling these pieces as well, or the music, or combination of everything? So how do you see yourself as an artist? Um, I suppose as an experiential artist, so you know, through the interdisciplinary connections that I make with uh, different technologies and with installations and the real-time aspect um, everything that's I make is saved if people give me their permission but it's an experience that's why it's hard to make a living from you know like being purely performative although I'm not the performer the audience is the vital part of the homeostatic kind of experience you know they are controlling it um, I'm there to monitor and look after them and be really careful about everything and to set up the situation to hopefully induce in them an altered state that's not going to be too challenging. You know, I don't want to be too gentrified about altered states. Let's go out there a bit, but you know, don't want to shake someone too much further than where they are currently ex used to. But I understand, you know, how is this art? It's, it's ephemeral. Mm -hmm. Experience. So, I, I mean, I don't have a club which did the first club to put on brain machines and VR. Was that Megatropolis? It, 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 before Megatropolis. Really? At the same time, yes. Yeah, wow. Scene. Oh. Wow, that's when I first, I was sort of a student so, around the time of Megatropolis. So, the, so the, we were doing this, and I did the first um, international VR um, club. And the thing about it was that they were very separate. They were very separate. You had the brain machine. Right. Oh, you, do you mean those light flashing things that people would wear? Yeah. yeah. And then more recently, I've, I've been at some, ev um, some events where there's somebody actually just down the road from here in Old Street. That's where I used to work, I think. <laughs> oh, that's um, yes. I use they kindly um, sponsor me. It's Pandora Star. That's right. Yeah. But what, I, what I'm interested in is where you're taking it because there's a very different thing when you talk about doing it with individuals and then doing it in a mass environment and even in a mass environment everything is possible i always have to work on a one-to-one -one basis well, have you had any crises i mean some people can go into fits and things like that oh to well, no, no as in i'm totally aware yourself? well i i have but lots of disclaimers and a one-to-one -one before we begin anything in fact my best friend who's here you experienced the onset of a migraine and you immediately pulled away didn't you when we're in the october gallery and that's when i knew to add that to the list because photosensitive epilepsy is the most obvious um, thing to warn anyone about using flickering stroboscopic lighting in an artwork. Um, I've just come from Somerset House this evening where I experienced um, an artist's work that involved a dream machine, the classic spinning kinetic sits on a record player cylinder, which I used to use a lot and I still do, I adore it. Mm. I was just pretty surprised and I asked the assistant when I was leaving the installation, it only said uh, uses or involves flashing lights. And I said, I'm not grilling you, I'm asking you, because I both do this inside and now I'm the audience, why do you not mention migraines? And their explanation to me just now, literally an hour ago, was um, if we mention the word migraine, it might actually... What? Trigger a migraine. And I was like... So I left a bit like that. I thought, well, I'm not going to say any more because I look like, you know, <laughs> do-gooder. So um, <laughs> I'm so careful with people. And if I, I'm supposed to also warn people, if I use the form correctly anti-anxiety medication, antidepressants. Unfortunately, some people who are menopausal say, I'm only on the antidepressants because of the menopause. I say, I can't take that risk. So that's how we can go really carefully with this, because I don't want anybody to have, you know, an ab reaction. But of course, I would like everybody to have, you know, an expansive experience. Are you the only one in this country doing this stuff, or uh, now, or? Who yeah, knows? <laughs> well, I'd like to. I'd like to think that I've, you know, created a position where I am, you know, long. I've been doing this 25 years, measuring brain waves as an artist, um, and added the lighting techniques to my tools, along with wearable speakers um, and ways of expanding the signal. So it's, you know, it's a whole room. It's not just a 
those lights that you mentioned, those brain machines, you're just looking at people looking at lights with their eyes closed. I've got lots of those. I love those. But they're very, you know, s s secular experiences. Whereas we can watch somebody in a room with the whole, you know, this is the dream machine if anyone's seen it before. And I'm actually wearing the EEG behind there because I like to sometimes hide the whole technical thing. It's not about, oh, look, there's somebody wired up with like a cyborg headset on. I was trying to get away with it. So, um, yeah, there's a whole performance there done for Ipswich. But I appreciate your questions. That was a good one. <laughs> um, Luciana, thank you very much. Thanks again for listening to the Trevor Shane Magazine podcast. If you like what you've heard, please leave us a review on your favourite podcast platform, share us on your social media channel of choice, or consider becoming a subscriber. Every subscriber gets a shout out in the podcast, as well as that great feeling supporting a truly independent contemporary art voice. You can subscribe to the magazine at www.trebuchet-magazine.com. Links are in the show notes. And to support the podcast, events and website, go to our Patreon pages where there is a growing amount of exclusive material for backers, from videos of events to other Patreon-related material, including what is sure to be our infamous backer shout-outs to a Trebuchet t-shirt. Of course, if you'd like us to answer any questions on the podcast or to mention a creative event that you think people should know about, do let us know via an email to megan at trebuchet.clip. Till next time, stay meditative. Stay meditative.